name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. May the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one in nature and one in essence, bless you, guide you, protect you, and deliver you from the evil one and his hosts. May our Lord and Savior, God revealed in the flesh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who has purchased us all with his precious blood on the cross, on Calvary, enlighten your path, show you the way, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Well, the reading from the Gospel of today's service, Holy Mass service, is from the Gospel according to St. John. And the Church Fathers have taken one portion from chapter 1 and another portion from chapter 2 to make the reading of today's Gospel. See, the Church Fathers, by the power of the Holy Spirit, chose certain passages from the Holy Bible and uh, that, are, that is relevant to the event according to the Church calendar. According to our church calendar, today is the fourth Sunday after the Feast of Epiphany. So throughout the church calendar, whatever that day is, the relevancy of that day, the church fathers chose reading from the Holy Gospel, from the epistles of St. Paul, and also, which we don't do at this stage, but later on we will, reading of the Old Testament that are all relevant for that particular date in the church calendar. So for today's gospel, it is from John the Beloved, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51, which is the end of the chapter. So chapter 1, verses 43 to 51, and then chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, and then chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, because chapter 1, verses 43 to 51, goes hand in hand with chapter 2 verses 1 to 11 or in another way chapter 2 is the explanation and light shedding on chapter 1 since we speak about the gospel of saint john or according to saint john in music when a professional musician comes to play a piece of music they place this chart in front of them, this musical chart, all notes. You will see there is a note in a different color at the very beginning of that chart, and it's normally in red. That note that is in red and everything else is in black, the one that is in red, it is called the key. As a professional musician, the moment they look at that red note, the key, automatically they understand what to expect in the entire musical chart. So that note may, see, may say C minor. They know exactly what scales to expect in the entire C minor. They will never play anything outside the scope of the C minor scale. If the key is misread, they will misread the entire chart and they'll play everything wrong. In this approach, the Holy Bible, every book in the Holy Bible has a key. That key, if you read it correctly, you'll read the entire book correctly. If you misread that key, you will misread the entire context in that book. The Gospel of John, what is the key to the gospel according to St. John? The divinity of Christ. The divinity of Christ. When you and I, when all of us approach the gospel according to St. John, we need to understand we are about to enter and dive into the divine Christ. I.e., John the Beloved says to the whole world, Jesus Christ is God himself, no one else, period. In the beginning, that's the opening verse to the entire gospel. In the beginning was the logos, the word, the intellect. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, period. Why are you arguing any longer? 
and the very beginning of jo John's gospel very clear the first verse in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God so who is Christ God period what's the argument then of that case closed so now when we read the right key then we will come and understand what's inside of this book there are seven signs in the gospel according to Saint John there are seven signs in the gospel of John when you look at these signs they're basically miracles but John the beloved deliberately refers to them as signs not miracles s i g n s sign he refers to them as signs not miracles is he short on vocabulary no he could have used the word miracle but no the holy spirit inspired john the gospel writer to put the word sign instead of miracle why because there is a huge difference that's why the reason why we are mentioning this just to give a glimpse of an idea what to expect when you come and approach reading the holy bible in its entirety every dot every word every letter everything has a meaning and purposefully placed there because the author of the book is god himself the holy spirit the source of wisdom everything has a meaning so to come and plug things randomly foolishly we will destroy everything and will feed the wrong food to the flock we will destroy them as well and mislead them and take them away from christ it's a concise moment it's a pivotal moment because we're dealing with people's lives and destiny to preach it's never meant to be easy just because you went and studied a little bit here a little bit there that does not qualify you to be a preacher you need to be appointed by god not you not your pastor no god there are seven signs in the gospel according to saint john each sign takes up three chapters each sign takes up three chapters seven signs times three 21 this is the gospel of saint john 21 chapters what are the seven signs in brief the seven sacraments of the holy apostolic universal church which christ founded and established on calvary by his own precious blood seven sacraments so for someone to come and say there are no sacraments in the church you are not in the church of christ period nothing personal this is the truth this is the word of the lord who are you trying to go against this is the word of the lord for 2000 year history this is the word of the lord there are seven signs which are the seven sacraments of the church and each sign takes up three chapters the first chapter is the introduction to the sign the second chapter is the sign itself and the third chapter is the result of that sign the outcome of that sign today's gospel is taken from chapter one and two of john the beloved when we come to chapter one two and three the first three chapters in the gospel of john what are these three chapters talking about the sacrament of holy baptism born again anybody home born again is the sacrament of holy baptism if you misread the key you've misread the whole gospel of john period but that's it to understand what the conversation was about between the lord jesus and nicodemus in john 3 to understand what that, that what conversation is all about you need to understand the key to the gospel so what happened in these two chapters the lord jesus goes out he meets he sees philip who happened to be one of the 12 apostles later on so and philip meets the lord jesus believes in him and he runs to call his friend nathaniel or nathanael now, the name nathaniel is a hebrew aramaic name syria it is a compounded word two in one nathanael so the proper pronunciation is not nathaniel is nathanael and 
If we say it sort of quickly, Nathneel or Nathneel. So Nathna El, El in Hebrew means God. Nathna, drawn to God. So the name Nathaniel, if anybody's name is Nathaniel, which is a beautiful name, your name means you are drawn back to God. Like a magnet, God has drawn you back onto Him. You were away distant, and now you've been drawn back to God. Nathna, to go back. El, to go back to God. So he goes and calls Nathna El, drawn back to God. He says, guess what, bro? Yo, bro, what's up? We found the Messiah. He said, what? Now, if it was an American style, was, what? He said, we found the Messiah. Mshiha, Mshicho, Mshiha. He said, you found the Messiah? He said, yes. Which part of Israel is he from? He said, oh, he's from Nazareth. He said to Philip, get a life. That's the gospel of the 21st century's language. He got a life. He said, what? From Nazareth? Messiah, he means God. Yeah? Revealed in the flesh. He said, out of all places. Out of all places. Out of all places. He said, impossible for the Messiah to come from Nazareth. Nazareth, my beloved, at the time, it was a place of trouble. All the thieves, the gangs, all came from Nazareth. Troublesome people, causing issues in society. He said, the Messiah. Do you understand what the Messiah means? God, God to come from a rejected place? Impossible. He said, no such thing. He said, before you judge Nathanael, come, watch, see for yourself, and then judge. Nathanael was approaching the Lord. The Lord Jesus looks at him and he says, here comes the son of Israel with no blemish in him. Here comes the son of Israel with no blemish or blame in him. Nathanael, for the first time ever, meeting the Lord Jesus, he has no idea who this man is. It's a first time encounter. He replies to the Lord and says, how did you know who I am? The Lord replies and says the following. He says, before Philip calling you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael hearing this from the Lord, before Philip calling you, I saw you under the fig tree. He said, you are G Jesus Christ, son of God. You are the king of Israel. You are, the, you are the king of Israel. The Lord says to him, just because I said to you, before Philip calling you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe, what are you going to say, Nathanael, when you see the heavens open and the angels of heaven going up and down on the Son of Man? Chapter 1 closes at verse 51 with these words. What are you going to say, Nathanael, when you see the heavens open and the angels of heaven going up and down on the Son of Man? The gospel according to St. John is an orchestra playing, a beautiful symphony, stunning, amazing. Why did Nathanael say, you are the Christ, son of the living God, you are the king of Israel? Why? By hearing from the Lord, before Philip calling you, I saw you under the victory. Why did Nathanael be overwhelmed with the statement said by the Lord? Why? See, there was three children under the age of two that were saved from the sword of King Herod. See, this story goes back all the way to childhood. There was only three children that they got delivered from the sword of King Herod. When the Magi's came and said to King Herod, today is born the king of the Jews. He said, go and search for him, find where he is and tell me so I can come and worship him. But in his heart, he wanted to kill him. How dare anyone else outside of King Herod to be the king for the Jewish nation. Well, kill this little baby. Three babies delivered from the sword of King Herod. One, John the Baptist. Two, the Lord Jesus himself. Three, Nathanael. What happened when he was a baby? The army came searching for their newborn baby. The parents hid Nathanael as a baby under a fig tree because the fig tree has massive leaves and all the way to the ground. When you hide something beneath it, you don't see. So they hid this baby under the fig tree. When the baby grew, 
Olda, the parents told this secret to Nathanael, which no other person knew about this secret except parents, Nathanael later on, and God who art in heaven. This secret was between God, parents, and Nathanael. He meets Jesus for the first time, the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus says, before Philip calling you, I'm going to take you back to your childhood. I, Jesus, I myself saw you under the fig tree. He looks at Jesus. He says, you're my age. I'm 30. You're 30. When did you see me when I was a baby? You were a baby too. Oh, you must be God. You must be God. He acknowledges this. You're God. I wish I had the time. I don't want to rush through. I won't give it justice. Nathanael. What you are going to say when you see heavens open and the angels of heaven going up and down on the Son of Man. I'll take you back all the way to the book of Genesis, the beginning of the Old Testament. Jacob was running from the hands of his older brother Esau because he stole the blessing from his brother Esau. Esau made a promise to himself, I will kill Jacob and there is no other way. How dare he steal the blessing from God that was given to me, he stole it. I'll never let go until I kill Jacob, my brother. So Jacob was running away from Esau, not to be killed by him. It got really dark. The sun is going down. He is exhausted. He is hungry. He is thirsty running in the wilderness. He said, I need to have a rest. Otherwise, I'll collapse. So he takes a rock. It's a long story. He puts it like a pillow. He sleeps and he sees a vision, a ladder, a ladder connecting heaven and earth. And on this ladder, angels of heaven going up and down on the ladder. He wakes up. He says, this place is none but Beth El. Beth means house. El, God. This place is none but the house of God. And this door is the door of heaven. Here, God, he is my voice, my cry. He saw a ladder connecting heaven and earth. Angels going up and down on the ladder. What Jacob saw in the Old Testament was symbolic of the true ladder who came in the New Testament. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why did he come? He came to connect heaven back to earth and earth back to heaven once again. Who is heaven? God. And who is earth? Us humans. Because since we broke God's word in the Garden of Eden, the gate of heaven was shut in the face of humanity, the earth. The true ladder came to connect heaven, God, back to earth, humanity. Just like that ladder with Jacob saw connecting heaven and earth, that ladder, angels were going up and down on it. The Lord Jesus says to Nathanael, what are you going to say when you see heavens open and the angels of heaven going up and down on the true ladder who is Christ the Lord. How did God, how did the Lord Jesus come to connect heaven, God, back to earth, humanity? Chapter 2 begins with these words. And after three days, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. What happened after three days? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, rose from the dead. See how the Holy Spirit talks? What happened after three days? The Lord rose from the dead. There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The Holy Mother was there. But Jesus and the disciples were invited. Ouch. You invite the Lord to a wedding? Are you kidding? They run out of wine. They run out of wine. What is wine? The wine makes your heart happy. King David talks in the Psalms. Khamra maghda libbit warnash. The wine rejoices the heart of man. Wine here resembles joy, happiness. See, you need to approach the Gospel of John theologically. That's a, it's the divinity of Christ, theology. They run out of wine. If wine represents happiness, of course they will run out of wine since the Lord is not the groom. You see, the Lord is the groom, no one else. You don't invite the Lord to the wedding. He is the rightful owner of the wedding. He came to be the heavenly groom to his bride, the beloved church. So he needs to be the groom. But what happened? We invited him to our own weddings. And don't we all do this, my beloved? We call Jesus to come into our house. We need to say, this is your house, Lord. And I'm nothing but a servant of yours. This is your house, not mine. Don't invite the Lord to your house. It's not yours, it's his. When we do things our way, 
will run out of joy. Our life will have no happiness in it because the true happiness of every single one of us life is the Lord being the center of that life, the foundation to that life, the crown of that life. When Jesus Christ rules over our life, this life is full of happiness and joy because happiness in, and joy is only experienced truly, genuinely, when I am embedded in the Lord Jesus, not outside of Him. Embedded. So they ran out of wine. Who went to the Lord Jesus? Who approached the Lord? The one and only, my sweetheart, my mom. I love my mother, the Holy Mother, Mother Mary. She goes to her son and she says, they run out of wine. And the Lord turns to her and says, Woman, what's it to you and me? My hour hasn't come yet. And then she turns to the disciples. She says, Whatever your master says, you do. When you look, when you look at the conversation between the mother and her son, the son and his mom, there is no connection whatsoever between the two of them. No connection. At a surface level, there's no connection. But if you look at it in depth, you can see the Holy Mother is so, so high in her spiritual stature. So high, so elevated. Wow. In a normal conversation between a mother and her son would have been like this. Son, they run out of wine. Okay, mom, can we find a bottle shop and we can get some more wine? Isn't it? She goes to him, she says, son, they run out of wine. He says, what's it to you and me, women? My hour hasn't come yet. What has this got to do with her question? Or with a request, nothing. All I'm saying, they run out of wine. What do you mean, woman? And what do you mean, my hour? What hour? She should have replied and asked him, can you please explain yourself, son? I don't understand. She didn't. She didn't even answer him. She didn't even ask him. She turns to the disciples and says to them, whatever your master says, you do. Unbelievable connection between the son and the mother, the mother and the son. Unbelievable connection. Unbelievable. She understood he's about to do something and something very foundational. He wasn't going to do it, but the mother interceded. He said, since I love you so much, mom, I won't break your word. Even though it's not my hour yet, but I'll do it because you asked. And since I love you so much, I will do it for your sake, even though it's not my hour yet. And which hour is this? The hour of the cross. The Lord came for this hour to be nailed on the cross. He came to embrace the cross to save and redeem the entire world. This hour had another three years and a bit to it because the wedding in Cana of Galilee was the very beginning of the Lord's ministry. He worked for three years and almost a half. So it was at his beginning. He didn't want to reveal who he is lest Satan realizes who the Lord is. He didn't want to reveal that, but he couldn't say no to mom. So she says to the disciples, whatever the, your master says you do. There were six vessels. He said, fill them up all the way to the top, to the brim with water. The Lord changes the water into wine. He says, go and call the steward of this wedding. Tell him to come and drink from this wine, which was changed from water into that wine. The steward comes, drinks. He says to the Lord, we put the good quality wine first. And after everyone is drunk, we put the cheap stuff. Because if we keep on putting the good quality wine all the way, all the time we'll go broke. If the wedding costs 10,000, it'll cost us a million bucks. So we put the good quality wine at the beginning because everybody's sober. And back then, by the way, the wedding used to go for seven days. Seven days they've been drinking. So they were swimming in wine, inside and outside. They were drunk to the core drunk to the core, gone with the wind, as they say. This guy came swinging right, left, left, right, drunk. He drinks from the wine of the Lord Jesus. He says to the Lord, we put the quality wine first, then the cheap, but you have kept the good quality wine till the end. The only way for a drunk person to drink wine and realizes it's good quality, this drunk person had to have been sober by the wine he drank. I ask you, somebody's drunk and drinks more wine, are they gonna be sober? They'll be finished. 
This guy was drunk. He drinks the wine of the Lord. He realizes this is good quality. How did he realize this? Because when he drank the wine of the Lord, he became sober. Therefore, this wine in the wedding of Gaina is not any wine. It is the blood of Christ. It's the blood of Christ. John, the gospel writer, the gospel of John is the depth of theology. What wedding? What Habib Albi? No tabule there. This is theology. You need to understand. You need to understand how to approach the Holy Bible. Theology. The depth of theology. He's talking about the divinity of Christ. So this is my blood. Women, what's it to you and me? My hour hasn't come yet. Which hour? The hour when I will be crucified and I will shed my blood for the remission of sins. When you drink my blood, you will become sober. Why? Because the sins you have been committing, the wrong things you have been doing, have made you drunk spiritually, just like the tangible wine makes you drunk physically, so as the sins have made you drunk spiritually. My blood came to wash away your sins and bring you back into being sober spiritually once again. So you can see me and know where I am. Sins have separated you from me. Sins have made you drunk. And a drunk person has no sense of direction, no sense of orientation, no sense of vision. He has no idea where his right hand from his left hand, where his head from his toes. He's lost, gone, does not know where to go and where to come from. Has no idea. So as the one who lives in sin, swims in sin, it is an absolute spiritual drunkenness, blindness, and disorientation. This is my blood in the wedding of Cana of Galilee, not wine. When he drank from it, he became sober and realized it is good quality wine. Unless he was sober, he wouldn't have known this is good quality. There is no wine that when you drank and you drink it, you become sober. There is no such thing. This is his blood. Why did the Lord Jesus refer to the Holy Mother as woman, not mother? And this is, open up your ears, your hearts, your minds, your souls, and stop being stubborn on your childish behavior. This has got nothing to do with you personally, my dear friend. This has got nothing to do whether you have misunderstood it. There is no shame in saying, I learned it wrongly. I'm coming back, I'm saying, sorry, Lord, because I was taught wrongly and I learned it wrongly and I spoke to people about it wrongly. There is nothing wrong with coming and confessing your mistake. When you confess your mistake, you are a saint in the eyes of the Lord. So don't be stubborn and remain on the high horse of self-pride. Come down and bow before the Lord Jesus and say, I have misunderstood you, Lord. Why did the Lord Jesus refer to the Holy Mother as woman, not mother? <laughs> Some people think, you see, the Lord even, he didn't even call her mother. See, her role is finished. You're finished. You're finished. If you don't repent, you're finished. I'm talking with love and concern for your well-being, my dear child. Since the Gospel of John speaks about the divinity of Christ, and since this wine is to do with Golgotha Calvary, the blood of Christ. And what is the blood of Christ? Is to forgive sins. Question to every Christian. Who forgives sins? God only. True or not? Can anyone else forgive sins? No, except God. Only God. So since the blood of Christ is there to forgive the sins of all humanity then only God can forgive sins since it's to do with forgiveness of sins then he, 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 he is God since he is God God cannot have a mother you with me if God says to Mary you're my mother as the divine God I'm talking about pay attention please if God says to Mary, you're my mother, that means she was before him and she gave birth to him. He's no longer God, she is. Since it's to do with forgiveness of sins, God is the only one who forgives as God cannot have a mother. As, as the divine Christ, he is the creator of Mary. 
No one precedes God. And even when we use the title mother of God, we don't mean it in the literal sense, God has a mother. Please. Please. That's why he referred to her as woman. Because this is my blood. And my blood forgives sins. And the only one who forgives sins is God. And God cannot have a mother. Therefore, you're a woman. Not my mother. As God. But also, the Lord Jesus referred to her as woman to honor her as well and to fulfill a prophecy in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 says the following. The seed of the woman shall crush, crush the head of the serpent. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. I ask every single human being that ever came to this face of this earth and whoever's going to come to the face of this planet. I'll ask all humanity. Doesn't matter you're a Christian or not. I'll ask you all. Every one of us, haven't we come from an earthly father and earthly mother? But did we come out of thin air? Definitely not from Adam and Steve. Definitely not. It was Adam and Eve. So get a life and move on. So since all of us, every single human being, prophets, saints, patriarch of the Old Testament, all, all, all humanity, every single one, including the Holy Mother Mary, every single one came from an earthly father and an earthly mother. The only human being that ever came and will ever come and there is none like him that came from an earthly mother only is Jesus Christ of Nazareth all glory to his holy name his birth is virginal he has no earthly father for his father is the one who art in heaven God the father is his dad on earth he has only earthly mother that is why Genesis 3:15 can only apply to Jesus Christ of Nazareth because he is the only one that came as the seed of the woman, not of the father. Wow. That's why he referred to her as woman. He is respecting her highly, honoring her highly, fulfilling the prophecy through the woman whose seed will crush the head of the serpent on the cross on Calvary. So I say to those people who disrespect the Holy Mother, repent, before the wrath of God comes upon you. Repent. How dare you disrespect the Holy Mother? How dare you? Since God honored her, who are we to disrespect her? Who are we? Unbelievable. See what Satan has done? Wrong, false teachings. Why? Because they misread the key. They misread the wrong note. So they taught the wrong book. Unbelievable. I haven't gone into depth yet. Let me tell you one thing. When the Lord Jesus changed that water into wine, he revealed his divinity. You know why? Because there is a substance that is, ap that is present in wine, absent in water. There is a substance present in wine, absent in water. What is that substance? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is present in wine. It is absent in water. Water is H2O. Hydrogen, oxygen. There is no carbon dioxide. Now, here's the question. Who is the one? Who is the one that can create out of nothing everything? Only God. Only God. We call ourselves creators. But we create things out of raw material. Chairs we create. But there is trees. We didn't create the tree, so we are not God. We can only create something out of something tree existing from a raw material. The only one, the only one who can create out of nothing everything is God. At the time of Moses, the prophet, he had that staff in his hand. He threw it on the, on the ground, it turned into a cobra, snake. Pharaoh, this poor Pharaoh, like so many poor leaders nowadays, See, Pharaoh thought he was in charge of everyone and everything. Poor thing, he's rotted now. Hmm? He's a dummy, mummy. See you later. And everyone is going to go with him. No one lives forever on earth, no matter what. God is the source of life. 
He, he gives it, he takes it. No one else. So Pharaoh brought his magicians. Like there are so many magicians nowadays. <laughs> Who work behind the scenes, behind closed doors on underground. These are magicians of the 21st century. Planning, plotting things. Child trafficking. These are magicians. Sons of the snake. Evil doers. Sons of the snake. The Lord sees you all. Let me tell you this. If these lost souls who have been blinded by Satan, I really feel sorry and I pray for them. Because if these lost souls, if they had an idea what it's like on the other side, they would have stopped everything. Satan has blinded them so far and deep, they think they're doing something of a great magnitude. Wow, look at me doing whatever I want. So lost to the core, they are swimming in filth and in darkness and in evils. But when they face the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as the true judge, they will become a little mouse like Satan, whom they worship now. And they won't know where to run. They can run, but they cannot hide. God sees everyone and everything. Where are you running, my dear? The elites. Who gives one penny? It's the Lord. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So Pharaoh brought magicians. They threw their stuff and turned into a snake. But that snake, that, that stuff of Moses, which turned to a snake, swallowed the snakes of those magicians. And then Moses grabbed it and it turned into a piece of wood in his hand again. But those other snakes of the magicians gone. Moses strikes the river Nile, turns into blood, real blood. The magicians come with some powder. It's not the one you sniff, eh? They come with a powder and they make some whatever nonsense like magicians do. And they turn it into a red color. Whoa, they're competing. Then God says to Moses, strike the staff into the dirt. Frogs came out of the dirt. The magicians looked. They said, uh, our magic is not going to work any longer. This is none but the finger of God because only God can bring something out of nothing and give it life. They can't bring out of dirt frogs, living frogs. They couldn't. So, if you're trying to find out what your future is and you go to a clairvoyant or a black magic thing and cards and I don't know what this jumbo mumbo nonsense, don't. Please don't. These people are lost. What clairvoyance? What cards? Please. Burn it all. I'll bring a bulldozer and make a freeway out of it. Don't ever, don't ever go to no sheikh. Go to no one and write you something and say, wrap it and put it in your pocket, under your pillow, hide it, I don't know where. This is, this is Satan way. You're opening a door you won't be able to shut later. Ah, but you see, the first time you go, it sounds good. Oh, this person told me a lot of things about me. They don't know me. Whoa, whoa, see, Satan. Don't worry, come. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I'll tell you everything about you. Hmm? I see you, brother. You think I don't know? I know a lot of things, but I just pretend not to know. When God intervenes, every power stops. Satan, everything, everything, everything. everything. So when the Lord changed the water into wine, carbon dioxide is present in wine, absent in water. Only God can make this happen. For water to change into wine, it's impossible. Jesus, our Lord, did it. Why? Because He's God revealed in the flesh. He does the impossible. So He revealed His divinity. Since He revealed His divinity, Mary, He had to call her woman. She can't be His mom. The divine has no mother. So who is Mary? The mother of the Word incarnate. The Logos incarnate. Not just the Logos. No. The Logos is the divine. The divine has no mom. This divine became man. She gave birth to this divine that became man. She is the mother of the word incarnate. And even in the Greek language, Theotokos, 
Theotokos literally does not mean the mother of God. It means the bearer of God. She carried him in her womb. There is a difference between a bearer and a mother. She bore God in her womb. Because the second person, the Logos, dwelt in the womb, in the womb of the Holy Mother. And took upon himself the human nature and became man. So she is the bearer of God. Theos Tokos. What united heaven, God, with humanity, earth, after three days, the Lord Jesus rises from the dead. But what did he do? What did he do? He changed water into wine. This is my blood. What united us back with God, the blood of Christ being shed on Calvary, on the cross. This is the unity that took place between divinity and humanity when the blood of Christ was shed on the cross on Calvary. And when did this, when did, when was this fulfilled? After three days, when the Lord rose from the dead. If the Lord had died and never risen, he wouldn't have saved us. But his resurrection is stamped sealed that our sins are forgiven if we accept him as Lord and Savior. So when he washed my sin away, I was reconciled, reunited back with God. He is the ladder that connects heaven and earth together. Unity. It was made possible after three days where he changed the water into wine by shedding his blood on Calvary on Good Friday and rising from the dead on Sunday, unity was brought and made possible between heaven God and earth man. So this is a brief explanation of what the gospel according to St. John is all about. It's eight o'clock. Can I just say something? Is that okay? Well, tough luck anyway. I was gonna say something. <laughs> Why did John the Beloved refer to these as signs, not miracles? The difference between a sign and a miracle is the following. A miracle, a miracle reveals the substance of the person. An example, what I mean. Let's say I'm, I'm standing here right in front of you. I'm a human being, you're a human being, we're the same. You look at me, I'm just one like all of you, no different. Imagine like I'm talking to you normal and all of a sudden I order this uh, box of tissue to rise in the air and I say to the box of tissue go and stand in the middle of the air and the box of tissue listens to me this is called a miracle when you see this all of a sudden you'll say oh wow we thought until that moment we thought he was just another human being like us but look at this miracle he just performed in front of us wow he's a different substance look at him he's different so the miracle is there to reveal the substance of the person. Wow. But the sign is a movement in the present moment, teaching you, reminding you and warning you of something futuristic coming your way and there is no escape from it. A sign is a movement in the present moment. From this movement in the present moment, you need to learn that something is coming your way in the future and there is no escape from it. I'll leave you with this. Please pay attention. When we read in the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, the book of Ecclesiastes teaches one thing, repentance. If you want to learn how to live a life of repentance, read the book of Ecclesiastes. You will learn how to live a repentant life all your life. Not just one day, all your life. You need to repent every day, not just once, forever, no such thing. Every day you wake up, say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Lord, have mercy on me. Every single day. When you read in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, King Solomon talks about the movement of the sun, S-U-N. This movement of the sun, we see it every single day right before our own eyes. But what do we learn from this sun moving? What do we learn? Biblically speaking, and I'm not talking about science, biblically. We see the sun rises early morning. Sometimes they'll say the sun will rise at 5 or 5 a.m. when it's sun. You wake up just before 5 and you wait, you'll see the sun popping up. When the sun rises at its infancy stage, you can stare at the sun with your eyes and you want have a blurry vision. You can look into the uh, into the sun without hurting your eyes. Why? Because the sun is just about rising 
It is weak in light, it is weak in heat. The rising of the sun is when I and all of us were born into this world. That's my birth. When this baby is born, mom and dad, are you listening? When this baby is born and those who are engaged and about to get married, listen, please pay attention. When the baby is born, he is a very tiny, soft flesh. This baby, you can shape it, you can mold it, you can do whatever to it, cannot resist you, cannot say no to you. You want to take the baby to the church, the baby can't say no. You want to take the baby to the club, the baby can't say no. You want to take the baby to the Lord Jesus, the baby cannot say no. You want to take the baby to Satan, the baby cannot say no. The baby is at your mercy, mom and dad. You can do whatever to that baby. They will never be able to say anything to you. But guess what? King Solomon says, learn from the movement. This movement is called sign in the Greek language. This movement of the sun is called sign in the Greek language. So look at the sun. When it initially rises, that's when the baby is born. You can look at it, you can mold it, shape it, nothing harms you. But guess what? The baby is not going to remain baby. As the time goes by, the baby is growing older. Uh -huh -huh. When does the sun become at its strongest moment? 12 noon, midday. At 12 noon, I dare you to stare into the sun. You'll go blind. The sun, it is at highest peak of strength in light and heat. You cannot stare at the sun anymore. This is when this baby becomes an adult, mature. And when they are adults, 18, 21, 30. Good luck, mom and dad. Go and say to them one word. They'll say, get alive, mom and dad. None of your business. I'll call the coppers if you go too much after it. What happened when this grown-up man, when this mature girl was one day a baby, what did you do with that baby, mom and dad? We didn't have the time for the Lord Jesus. We never read the Holy Bible while putting the baby to sleep. We never took the baby to church because we were too busy with the world. We were busy with restaurants and holidays and arguing about materialistic things where we should have been as parents, responsible adults to teach my baby the way of God. We left it behind. But the baby grows, you can't stop it. The baby grew knowing only what you taught them. And now you realize this baby who's an adult is mixing with the wrong people. So, son, let's go to church. But Daughter, let's go to church. Mom, listen, one more time you tell me church, I'll leave the house. Okay? I'm going out with my friend downtown. What church? And then we come chasing the father. Please, Father, come and talk to our children. They're not listening. It's a struggle. But let me tell you now to that young man and young woman who are disobedient to the parents, to the church, to, to God. Let me tell you one thing. The son of your life will never remain strong always. After midday, what happens to the sun? It starts going down. As it goes down, the light becomes dimmer. The heat becomes less. And one day, just like the sun rose, one day definitely the sun will go down. Your life, you will never remain that strong man and that strong woman all your life, my child. Remember, look at the sun and learn from it. Do you want to have a happy, healthy ending? Have a happy, healthy start. When we work, we save up for our retirement, don't we? Because when we retire, we cannot work anymore. We're too tired, too old to work. So I need to have some saving on the side for those days when they come. But those days will come. Those days will come. So if you are disobedient to God, to your parents, to everyone who's given you the right advice for your own salvation, you disregard all that. Remember, you will never remain that strong man and strong women. The time will come, you'll grow older. And as you grow older, the sun of your life will become lesser and dimmer and dimmer until the day I cannot walk any longer, cannot help myself. They put me in nursing home, begging for a glass of water, and no one has given it to me. Why? Because when I was young, I didn't give those who begged me for a glass of water. When I was young, I was disobedient to everyone who spoke to me nicely. 
at the end people will be disobedient to me like I was disobedient to others. What goes around comes around. Learn from the movement of the sun and save yourself. You want to have a, a, an end with people around you, supporting you, helping you? Be around people now, those who are unable to look after themselves, go and look after them. You look after them now, they will look after you later. What you plant is what you will harvest at the end. That's why they are signs. Read the sign and learn from it. Amen. Let's bow our heads. We ask the Lord Jesus, as we are coming to receive him in the true body and the true blood, we ask him to forgive our sins. Confess your sins as we recite this prayer of absolution. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the walks of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will, to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. May the Lord Jesus forgive your sins. May the Lord Jesus make you worthy to come forth and receive him in the true body and blood of Christ. So God bless you. May the Lord always, always show you the way, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. May the Lord guide you. May the Lord protect you. May the Lord enlighten your heart, your mind, your soul, your entire being. May the Lord show you that there is no other way for salvation and redemption except him. For in him lies life eternal. In him lies ultimate and fullness of redemption and salvation. He is the one and only. He is in everything and everyone and everything and everyone is in him. When Moses said, ask that God, what is your name? So I can tell your people who are waiting to hear your name at the foot of the mountain. What shall I say? He said, go and tell them, I am that I am Yahweh, Yahuwah. I am that I am. I am that I am in the nutshell interpretation he says go and tell them Moses when they look at the water that water is I am when they look at the bird that bird is I am when they look at the leaf that leaf is I am the tree the heaven the stars the moon the sun the galaxies the earth humanity animals everything is I am for I am the creator of everyone and everything and everyone and everything is I am. I am in all and all are in me. This is Christ. And when the Jewish priests and Pharisees approached him and they said, Who are you? He said, How dare you? You say this and this about you. He said, they said, We know God spoke with Abraham our father. Who do you think you are? He said, Abraham, your father, saw my day and rejoiced. I said, you haven't even got to the age of 50. He is 2,000 years before you. You are not even 50, you're 30. When did Abraham see your day and rejoice? The Lord replied and said, before Abraham was, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am that same I am who spoke to Moses, spoke to the Pharisees and the, and the Jewish priests. Before Abraham was, I am the ever-present God. The Lord be with you.